I think we should begin. First of all, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the second Angavanta Fall Symposium uh, series. Uh, Natalie, would you like to, to share the screen? Yeah, so in this series, we're, we're taking the opportunity to introduce our new scientific advisory committee members uh, to the chemistry community. Um, and the talks and the thoughts of the first four members were presented in the first symposium on the 29th of September. And these are available on the journal homepage if you want to see what um, they spoke about from their science and what they had to say about their role in the journal. Uh, next slide, please, Natalie. Now, many of you know and have published and read articles in Angavanta, but what may have passed you by is that Angavanta is actually owned by the German Chemical Society, or the GDCH for short. Uh, if you want to move to the next slide, Natalie. Now, the German Chemical Society is based in Frankfurt in Germany and has around 30,000 members. Um, and the GDCH plays an important role in the worldwide chemistry community. And it also plays a, a key role in the development of Angavanta Chemie. And here's the new governance structure. To give you an idea of how this all works, um, the scheme gives you an idea of how we all work together. So on the left is the editorial office and the executive committee. And we are all full-time professional editors. And we work together with the GDCH through the Angavanta Council, whose representatives are shown here on the right, uh, including the president, the executive director, um, the chair of the International Advisory Board, and the publishing advisor from the GDCH board itself. And most recently, the chair of the Scientific Advisory Board, Helmer Venemus, who's one of the speakers today, is also a regular attendee at these council meetings. Next slide, please, Natalie. Now, the scientific, ad, inter, scientific advisory board here, the scientific advisory committee, um, is, a, is a group of 10 individuals with excellent science, um, great backgrounds in all different areas. And they're, you know, they cover all different fields. They give us insights into lots of different aspects of our day-to-day uh, -day job. And this helps us in the decision-making uh, processes, particularly with the difficult decisions that we have to make from time to time. Um, and especially where their active research um, is beneficial. Next slide, please, Natalie. Similarly, with the International Advisory Board, um, they cover all different areas of research and their members come from all different countries and all different backgrounds. And they help not only in the decision-making process, but in providing important feedback on the key developments from their various communities. And this of course is really important in, in looking how we drive the journal forward in the, in the future. Uh, for Angavanta, it's an honor to have such a fantastic group of chemists and as board members who act as ambassadors and as role models for the journal. It's also great for us, um, if you like, as editors, that so many of them are regular contributors to the journal with their most innovative research. Um, okay, and with that, I'd like to pass you on to Natalie, who will introduce the first speaker for today's symposium. Thank you, everybody. Many thanks, Neville, for this short introduction on Angewandte Chemie. Let's get right started with today's scientific presentations. But we are, of course, also keen to hear from all of you in the audience. So just a bit of housekeeping. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions for the speakers, and then we will try and cover as many of them as possible after the talks. Our first speaker today is Helma Wedemers. She studied chemistry at the Goethe University in Frankfurt, and then received a PhD degree from Columbia University in New York. She moved to Nagoya University for postdoctoral work before joining Basel University as assistant professor. And then in the fall of 2011, so I guess exactly 10 years ago now, she moved to the ETH in Zurich, where she is professor of organic chemistry, focusing on asymmetric catalysis 
chemical biology and supermolecular chemistry. Her research has been recognized with numerous lectureships and awards, um, including most recently the Arthur C. Cope Scholar Award from the ACS just this year. And today she will share with us her work on using peptides as asymmetric catalysts. Thank you, Helma. Thank you so much for the introduction, mm -hmm. Natalie. Right, now you should be able Alrighty. to share your screen. Let me share my screen then. Alrighty, so let me start by saying it's a great honor to speak here and also it's a great honor to um, be now the chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee of Angewandte. We'll hope to, well, it's been a fantastic start of our co collaboration and we'll look forward to um, continuing this. So, science, let's go to science. So, my lab has a keen interest in addressing the question whether small molecules can fulfill functions for which nature decided to develop large macromolecules. And by asking this question, we're on the one hand interested to learn more about nature's macromolecules, but we're also utilizing the power of organic synthesis to generate functions by utilizing all of the possible building blocks that we have available as chemists to generate functions that nature might have not been available to access simply because of the limited set of building blocks nature has. So by saying this, my lab has keen interests in chemical biology. We also have keen interests in supramolecular chemistry and materials. And I would love to tell you more about any of these topics, but given that we're still a Nobel Prize month, congratulations to Ben and Dave, fantastic what you launched with your seminal discoveries or relaunched with your seminal discoveries um, pretty much 20 years ago, congratulations. I thought I'd dedicate today's lecture to our work on um, asymmetric catalysis with peptides. Now, why are we interested in asking the question whether peptides can serve as catalysts. Well, if you look into nature and our everyday life, you'll notice that peptides fulfill many, many, many different functions. Some are um, used in nature as hormones, neurotransmitters. The worst toxins are actually peptide-based. Many of those toxins also serve as lead structures for the development of blockbuster therapeutics. And there's a lot of interest in peptide-based drugs these days in the chemical and pharmaceutical industry. But there's also much of a sweet touch of peptides as PARTAMs, nothing else like a peptide. So many, many different functions can be fulfilled by peptides. And I would argue the reason for that is that by combining different amino acids with each other, you can access a lot of structural and functional diversity. And in light of all of these different functions, isn't it somewhat surprising that not a single catalytically active peptide is known in nature? So that's what made us curious to ask, well, can peptides serve as catalysts? And what features would they would have? Would they have features that are in the middle of what we know from nature's catalysts, enzymes that are big, often have a limited substrate scope, and have quite a bit of flexibility within their structure? Are they in the middle then between enzymes and small catalysts, synthetic catalysts that are generally regarded as well, certainly smaller than enzymes, where we seek for a broad substrate scope and that are typically rigid by design? So those were the questions we, we have and we had and we have um, for the question, can peptides serve as catalysts? We started quite a few years ago by using a combinatorial screening to ask whether peptides could catalyze aldol chemistry. And using this catalytic, using this combinatorial screening, we quickly identified the peptide proline, proline aspartic acid as a catalyst that is very efficient for catalyzing aldol chemistry. In comparison to proline, where you need 30 mole percent, only one mole percent of the, of the peptide suffices to obtain the products in very good yields and stereoselectivities. 
And building from there, and this combinatorial screening really allowed us to identify, you could call it a privileged peptide structure with two prolines and the third amino acid at the C terminus. We then realized pretty quickly that one can tailor the structure and thereby the conformation of this peptide in order to convert a range of different aldehydes with different electrophiles. So tailoring of the structure allowed to um, accommodate the needs for different substrates with the peptide to obtain the desired products and really very good yields and stereoselectivities, again, with low amounts of the catalyst, of the peptide catalyst only. And that hold for many different substrates that I summarize here on this one slide where you see that quaternary stereogenic centers can be generated, but also then on this slide where you see that the scope of reactions that can be catalyzed with this type of peptide motif is really pretty large. And I summarizing why that is, well, or, or summarizing the features, first of all, all of this work showed us that peptides are very reactive, more reactive than a single amino acid, stereoselective, and chemoselectivity can also be tailored into the structure. What are the reasons? Well, their structure is modular and can thereby be tuned and is adaptable. Furthermore, before we, and I really want to dedicate this talk and showing you how one can use the modularity and understanding of the conformation in order to tune the features of the structure and the conformation of the catalyst in order to carry out reactions as you wish. Before doing that, let me highlight one more thing, one feature, one can do peptide catalysis in flow with sizable quantities of products and again, high reactivity and selectivity allows us to get products um, in, in good yields and stereoselectivities. So these are the features. Let's now move on to understanding how their conformational features of peptides enables these features. And at the start, we need to look into the reaction mechanism. So we've done quite a few studies on, in particular, the reaction between aldehydes and nitroolefins catalyzed by our peptide catalysts. And these kinetic studies um, enlightened us that first the enamine forms, that then reacts in the rate and stereoselectivity determining step with the electrophile the nitroolefin to form this aminium nitronate. And then an intramolecular protonation takes place. Um, where then water that is first of all generated in the enamine formation step hydrolyzes this aminium ion back to the catalyst and provides the product. There's no product inhibition. And all of these insights, and I encourage everybody to care about mechanistic studies because what that allowed us is to optimize reaction conditions further all the way that we can run them, for example, under neat reaction conditions without any solvent. Alrighty. What about the conformational features? Let's start with the conformation of our ground state catalyst. What would you think are these conformational features? Do you think this catalyst is rather flexible or rigid? I think many of you who are listening think, well, a peptide is inevitably flexible. Short peptides are known to be rather flexible. And that's what I actually thought before we performed NMR-based studies. At the same time, I thought, okay, the proteins could rigidify. But what I didn't expect is that this peptide really has one main single conformation only in its ground state. That structure is a beta turn structure that is stabilized by three hydrogen bonds. One here, which is a typical beta turn hydrogen bond, one from the um, amide NH from that second amide with the acid, and one is kind of a salt bridge between this acid here and the secondary amine, which is the reactive center. So it's really a rigid structure. Yet you might now say, well, 
but it's the enamine that is the reactive species. The enamine reacts with the nitrolefin. So what about the conformation of the enamine? And you're absolutely right in asking this question. The enamine structure is far more flexible. It's not fully flexible, but it's more flexible than the ground state catalyst. The salt bridge is broken up, and as a result, it cannot be such a compact structure anymore. So what we have here, we have here a, an adaptable conformation where a balance between rigidity and flexibility is accommodated within the structure of a peptoid. And that is exactly what we know is often key to enzymes, where also the enzyme is flexible enough to accommodate the needs of different transition states and intermediates that have to go on through in the course of a catalytic cycle. So a lot of similarities reminiscent of the peptide with enzymes, despite the fact that it's a small molecule. How can we control the conformation? And we've learned a lot. I will focus in this presentation only on one particular feature, and that is the tertiary amide that you might have noticed as part of the peptide structure between the terminal two proline residues. And tertiary amides are known to undergo cis trans isomerization, a feature that is actually used by nature to regulate protein functions, maybe protein folding, signal transduction, and also a lot of enzymatic activities are regulated by this trans cis isomerization. You then consider this for the peptide. Already in this two-dimensional structure, you can easily appreciate that whether you have a trans or a cis amide at the terminal end will matter, in particular when you also consider the enamine that is then the reactive intermediate. So my former student, Tobias Schlitzer, excellent student, really drove this work in large parts forward. He asked, well, how can we tune the trans cis ratio of our peptide? Well, there are different tools. One can, on the one hand, install substituents. And we know this very well from our work on synthetic collagen, for example. Substituents installed at the pyrrolidin ring tune the trans cis ratio. But you introduce a substituent, and thereby you're changing two parameters. We therefore settled, or I will therefore focus here, on tuning the trans cis ratio by changing the ring size here of the um, of the pyrrolidin ring. So what we made or what Toby made is not only the five, but then also the four membered analog and the six membered analog. And then investigated what is the transist ratio around this amide bond here, this central amide bond, and found that the transist ratio increases by going from the four to the five to the six membered ring. We then looked into how this change in the transist ratio would affect the stereoselectivity of these peptidic catalysts with our simple model reaction that you see up, up on the slide. And found that both the dia as well and the, and the enantioselectivity increase with an increase of the transist ratio. So the higher the transist ratio, the more of the trans conformer, the higher is the serious selectivity. And that holds true for many different substrates. Here is a list of substrates that we have tested. The six-membered ring analog outperforms the five-membered ring analog. And remember, the five-membered ring is not bad at all, but six is even better. With respect to dia and enantioselectivity, selectivity, but also with respect to reaction rate, you see that the six-membered ring is an even faster catalyst compared to the five-membered analog. Half of the time is needed to, um, with the six-membered ring analog to reach the same amount, or well, to, 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 to get half of the substrates con converted. Well, given that it's so much faster, what about the amount of catalyst that is needed? So I've shown you before that we can do it reactions with 1 mole percent or 0.1 mole percent. Now we can reduce the catalyst loading to 0.05 mole percent without getting, without having to pay with lower stereoselectivity. So 0.5 mole percent, just to put this into perspective, we can now use 
as little as 10 milligrams of the catalyst, which is a small molecule, and obtain more than 8.5 grams of the desired product with excellent stereoselectivity and yield. So this peptide here has is holding the world record in low catalyst loading with amine-based catalysts. Alrighty. So we now know that a tertiary amide is useful for improving reactivity and stereoselectivity, and we know how to do this. What about the enamine? Does the enamine, how can we use the enamine to control reactivity and stereoselectivity? For this, we need to go back to um, seminal work by, I think, heroes for all of us in organic chemistry, who taught us that the degree of enamine pyramidalization and thereby the overlap between the lone pair of the nitrogen and the pi star of the enamine double bond is key for reactivity of enamines. The lower the pyramidalization, the higher is the nucleophilicity. These studies were carried out with um, mainly achiral secondary amines. But of course, now we have a chiral secondary amine if we do catalysis. So here now, we also need to consider that an anti-approach or an anti-orientation between the lone pair of the nitrogen and the incoming electrophile, as in particular, my wonderful floor neighbor Dieter Zeba showed us, is the approach with which an enamine approaches, or the direction with which an enamine approaches an electrophile. And if you relay this now to the um, chirality of an organocatalytic secondary amine, you now have the possibility of having an endo situation or an exo, where an endo, the lone pair is on the same side as the substituent at the alpha position, in an exo, it is on the opposite side. Now we hypothesized that endo should be fast, exo should be slow. And asked then, how important is the prioritization direction for enamine reactivity using secondary amine catalysts? And for this, we use DFT calculations and NMR spectroscopy to first of all investigate what is the pyramidalization degree of a series now, again, of four, five, and six membered ring derived enamines. You see that the pyramidalization degree is smallest in case of the five membered enamine, followed by the piperidine and then the acetidine. So you would predict that the proline is the fastest, the piperidine is the next fastest, and the acetidine is the slowest, based simply on the pyramidization degree. If one then looks now also at the endo and the exo ratio, one sees that the four-membered ring is only endo, it's five-membered, 80% endo, and the six-membered, 20% endo. So now let's do the experiment. We've made these three analogs now with the four, five, six member rings at the terminal end. Here's our prediction based on the degree of chromatization. But what we see here is actually that proline is the fastest as expected, but then comes the acetidine and only then the piperidine. So the piperidine with the significant contribution of the exo enamine is slower compared to the four-membered enamine that has a larger degree of pyramidalization but is exclusively endo um, configured. So that clearly tells that both the degree and the direction of pyramidalization affect the enamine reactivity. And that makes then, um, the, that let us make the prediction, well, you know, our pyrolidin um, ring is only 80% endo um, configured. If we could improve this to higher, we would then pr presumably increase the reactivity and the stereoselectivity even further. And now we actually succeeded by 
rigidifying the pyrrolidin ring further, installing a substituent here, a octahydroindole derivative. Here we retain the pyrrolization, but go to exclusively endo. Um, and indeed, this catalyst de derivative is an even better catalyst with respect to the stereoselectivity, but also with respect to its reactivity. So both are affected by improving the um, endopyramidalization. Endo and with this catalyst, one can now even convert heterocyclic substrates with excellent stereoselectivities and yields. And those substrates pose true challenges to other secondary amines because you can imagine that many of those sites of these heterocycles can hydrogen bond and thereby deactivate other secondary amines. Whereas this peptide here is so robust, so chemoselective that it's not effective in its reactivity and stereoselectivity. All right. So we've learned from these studies that a tertiary amide and an endoperonization are beneficial for improving reactivity and stereoselectivity of peptidic catalysts and all that matters, also other secondary amines with respect to the endoperonization of the enamine. Let me finish this presentation by um, an insight, but by, by showing you how one can tune the diastereoselectivity of peptidic catalysts. And when I say tune is, what I really mean is reverse the diastereoselectivity. Those of you who are in the field of organocatalysis will probably know that there are lots of reactions, that lots of publications that showcase catalysts for aldehyde additions to nitrolophins. Now, in essence, all of those catalysts have a syn selectivity. This reaction is such a popular reaction because the products are very useful for generating in a very straightforward manner, pyrrolidins, gamma lactams, gamma amino acids, and many more um, derivatives that are of therapeutic use. Many of those therapeutically active compounds would require though, not a syn selective addition, but an anti-selective addition. But the only, but the syn selectivity arises, as Dieter Seebach taught us, from a transition state where we have a CC facial attack or situation from an E configured enamine and an E configured nitrolefin. The only examples where um, an anti selectivity was observed was by either tethering or changing by tethering the configuration of the nitroolefin, very nice work by Ma, but then very substrate specific, or the enamine configuration, very nice work by late Carlos Barbas, where you then use hydrogen bonding in order to tether Z-configured nitroolefin or enamine. And that is substrate tailoring and not arising from the catalyst. The only catalyst that does an anti-selective um, addition is from the Maruoka panel group, but it is limited to very small aldehydes. Only propionyl reacts with this because the steric demands are too big. So we're asking whether one could have a catalyst that would allow for anti-selectivity and that would not be limited to specific substrates. Now, how could one achieve this? Well, as I've shown you, the Seebach transition state um, causes the syn selectivity, and it is due to the trans enamine that is preferentially formed if you have a substituent at one of the two alpha carbons. If you had, though, a, an SS configured enamine, that would guide you into the anti selectivity. Because you would then have a re syn attack that would arise, that would provide the anti product. So, how could you then favor cis versus anti, uh, cis versus trans? 
Well, the logic would be if you install sterically bulky substituents at the other side of the enamine nitrogen, you would have steric repulsion and that should flip the equilibrium to the side of the s -cis configured enamine. That is hard because once you install substituents at both sides of the nitrogen of your catalyst, you reduce typically the reactivity a lot. But I say typically, I've shown you that the peptides are very reactive catalysts where such a such steric bulk should probably be tolerated and thereby allow for obtaining the antiproduct. So let's see if this works, what I've just hypothesized. And I guess I wouldn't be telling you if this wouldn't work. Here's the parent catalyst with its syn anti-selectivity and the EE of the anti diastere isomer. Now, if you add the two methyl groups, you mellow it out. You have essentially a one-to-one diastere selectivity, and you see that the enhanced selectivity of the anti is decent. And then further tailoring of the catalyst by using all of the lessons that we've learned from what I've shown you before, we, you can get a decent diastere selectivity for anti and an excellent enhanced selectivity of the anti-isomer. And that is broad for a broad range of different substrates. One get the anti um, pre um, diastere isomer pre pre preferentially, plus very, very good enhanced selectivities of this anti conformer. Alrighty. So with that, I hope I've convinced you that peptides are worthwhile to look at and consider as asymmetric catalysts. Certainly Scott Miller's group, who has looked at many different other reactions um, of this type, not with secondary amines, will echo this. This tripeptidic catalyst has all of the features you want to have in um, small molecule catalysts. On top, you can it, it is chemo and steroid selective, and you can tailor due to the modular structure, the chemo and steroid selectivity. From a fundamental standpoint, the balance between conformational rigidity and flexibility is key. And that of course also um, shows that peptides have features that one would on the one hand assign to enzymes, balance between rigidity and flexibility and others, a small size, that one would assign to synthetic catalysts. You might now say, well, you're telling us features about enzymes, but enzymes work in water, whereas everything you've shown us works or uses organic solvents. And you're right. But let me show you that peptide catalysis also functions quite well in water. The limit here is actually the poor solubility of the substrates in, in water. But once you attach an alkyl chain to the peptide, you form a foam. And in this foam, the substrates dissolve, form an, an emulsion forms. And in this emulsion, one gets very good stereoselectivities and yields of the desired products here too. So that suggests that maybe peptides, possibly in bubbles, we're at the core of what, you know, of, of what we now coin life, and peptides likely have played a role in the evolution of enzymes. And if I've said in the very beginning that we're not aware of a single catalytically active peptide in nature, well, maybe we just haven't found it. So I leave you with this thought, but thank the people who were responsible for this. You've seen um, a lot of the names along the way, but I really want to highlight Toby, Tobias Schnitzer, who has been an absolutely outstanding graduate student. He's on the market for academic jobs, so watch out for him. He's really, really ter terrific. You see Jasper here, Greta, Elena, Jonas, and Martin, who is now our peptide catalysis team. I thank them. I thank all the ones who laid the foundations. I thank the collaborators that we've had for some of the projects and also the funding agencies. And I thank all of you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Helma, for this really inspiring talk. I was particularly impressed by the low catalyst loadings because I remember very well from my own days working with organic catalysts, 
how challenging this can be. So I'm, I'm really impressed. Um, so now we have time for questions. We have a few minutes left. Um, we already have the first question. So maybe I will read this out. It's by uh, Gamini Rajaparse. And they ask, uh, thank you for showing us beautiful catalytic activities of simple peptides. I am wondering whether these catalysts could be coated on inert electrode surfaces to develop electrocatalytic materials. Then the rates of reactions can be controlled by controlling the applied potential and can be determined by measuring the current density. The mechanisms could then also be simply deduced. Excellent question. You know, I don't see any reason why you cannot immobilize these peptides on other surfaces than what we have done so far. So we've immobilized them on polystyrene resins, on polystyrene poly polyethylene glycol resins. We've immobilized them on metal nanoparticles. They all work very, very nicely. So absolutely, you could probably do what you've just su suggested. Excellent thought. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Helma. So I see no further questions at the moment. I'll maybe give it a few more minutes. Maybe one question from me. Um, you've shown that you've made a lot of peptide catalysts with your modular approach. So I was wondering, can you store them quite well so that you have them available to reuse or do you have to make them from scratch quite often? No, we okay. do have our peptide library now. So, it's, you know, I, I hesitate to, to call collections of compounds libraries. If you have only 10, I don't call it a, a library, but now we have made so many variations to understand what we're doing that we probably have 50 or so, 100. And those we actually use, yeah, you know, we store them. So they're, you know, peptides are dinosaurs. <laughs> collagen, as we know it in our body, has been the same collagen in dinosaurs. And, you know, dinosaur bones still have that same collagen. Yes, peptides are dinosaurs. And let me point out maybe also, you know, the salt bridge that I pointed out, Yeah, that certainly stabilizes okay. the peptide more because, you know, the salt bridge does not ex prevents exposure of the amine to air. Yeah. And therefore these secondary amines are probably more stable compared to other secondary amines and have less side reactions also. I didn't go into this for the sake of time, but that's, you know, we have hardly any side reaction. They're very clean. Okay. So that then also helps with the catalyst loadings. Maybe. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Helma. It seems there are no open questions at the moment, but we will get a chance uh, to talk to you again for the meet the editor session. Um, so Thank you very much, Helma. And then we can maybe move on to our next speaker, uh, Walter Leitner. Uh, Walter is the director at the Max Planck Institute uh, for Chemical Energy Conversion in Mülheim an der Ruhr and holds the chair of chemical technology and petrochemistry at RWTH Aachen University. And he's also the scientific director of, of uh, the Joint Catalytic Center of uh, RWTH Aachen and Covestro. He studied chemistry at the University of Regensburg, where he also conducted his PhD studies before moving to the University of Oxford for postdoctoral work. His research focuses on an organometallic approach to catalysis motivated by green chemistry. His team's efforts have, of course, also been recognized by numerous awards. And together with Christoph Gürtler from Covestro, he was among the finalists uh, for the Deutsche Zukunftspreis and the European Inventor Award for their work on using carbon dioxide as a raw material for sustainable plastics. And uh, today he will speak about fire and ice, catalytic synthesis using hydrogen and carbon dioxide. And uh, we're very grateful that you're here today with us and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Well, I thank you, Natalie, for this very kind introduction. And I'm very happy uh, to be with you today and share some of our recent research and also give a little bit of a background what chemical energy conversion and some words like power to X or CCU um, mean and, and why we're so interested in this. So let me try. I hope you can see the screen already. Yes. Um, and it should be coming up as the shared screen. And we also can switch off the control panel so that you can see better what's going on. OK, Perfect. so here we go. First of all, Max Planck Institute for Chemical Energy Conversion. 
It's actually uh, on the Max Planck scale, a relatively young institute. It uh, will have its 10 year anniversary next year. You see there's still a lot of construction work going on. There is a history at the site in Mülheim on the Ruhr in Germany. So there are two Max Planck institutes there. Um, and uh, there was a history of this institute uh, for over 50 years as the Max Planck Institute for Radiation Chemistry and Bioinorganic Chemistry. And um, uh, 10 years ago, it has been uh, refocused as the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Energy Conversion. The second institute at the same site, which is just behind this building and you can't see it, is the Max Planck Institute for Kohlenforschung, um, which you might have come across recently because Ben List is working there, who just won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry a couple of days ago. A few days ago. So we're very excited still that we're at this uh, at this site and that we have these two institutes here. And this is a picture of my department. So at the Max Planck Institute, you have apprentices, technicians, everybody's there on the on, on this picture, and also the group leaders and the PhD and the postdocs, of course. And they're all most of them wearing t-shirts that say always use the green chemistry tools. Um, and so this is actually what we're trying to do, we try to utilize the raw material change and the energy input change that is going on currently um, um, as a way also to find new pathways to chemistry, to chemicals by using the green chemistry tools. So that's the green chemistry target for catalysis research at our team. We design and make on the basis of a rational mechanistic understanding, new catalysts. These can be either molecular catalysts as shown here. Most of the time they are actually because we come from an organometallic background. But in recent years, we also started increasingly to use an organometallic approach to make metal nanoparticles. And I will mention that in a, in a minute very, very briefly. But all of the design is typically based on a mechanistic hypothesis and we try to get a lot of mechanistic understanding how these catalysts actually work. Then we apply them to certain reactions. There's always a target reaction that is the background of the design. This could be biomass utilization to make valuable products, a lot of CO2 chemistry, and that will be the focus of my talk today, but also chiral catalysis, asymmetric catalysis, more for fine chemicals and fine chemical applications uh, play a role. And because all of this, what I told you so far, is actually liquid phase chemistry, is chemistry that happens in some form of a reaction medium of a, of a liquid or liquid-like medium. We study a lot the interaction of the molecular site with its larger environment, be it nanoparticles on particulars or ports, or also homogeneous organometallic catalysts in various reaction media, including, for example, supercritical fluids or biphasic multiphasic system. And that leads directly into reaction engineering concepts. How can you immobilize or intrinsically separate and compartmentalize homogeneous or organometallic catalysts? And that way go to continuous flow applications, for example. Um, uh, and then we even work together very much uh, with uh, uh, chemical engineers and process engineers to evaluate the pathways and the processes, whether they really lead to lower carbon footprints and more sustainable processes. And so that directly leads back to the catalyst design because the catalyst must fulfill the reaction, but it also must fit into the chemical engineering uh, concept that we devise. So it's, it's, it's not a linear approach from small scale to large scale, but really a closed circle as, as shown here. So that very quickly, just briefly on the material side, because I will only mention this one slide on this, because very recently you see it down here, uh, just a, a few months ago, uh, we've published actually a, an accounts of chemical research on this approach, uh, what we call nanoparticles on molecularly modified surfaces, and in particular metal nanoparticles that are on supports that have been modified with ionic liquid type structures, and we call them nanoparticles at silt supported ionic liquid phases. Um, and we study how the activation of hydrogen occurs on these metal nanoparticles from a purely homolytic cleavage to a very clean heterolytic cleavage into protons and hydrides, which lead to different outcomes in the hydrogenation and hydrogenolysis reactions. And by the molecular modifier on the, sub, on, on the support, we can very much influence 
these pathways in close contact to the metal nanoparticles. And if you want to find out more, I direct you to that recent uh, review article. But today's menu is different. I'll talk a little bit about power to X, what that means, how do we harvest renewable energy into the chemical value chain? So that's power to X, carbon free energy to valuable products. Um, and after a short introduction, I'll focus on the reactions of CO2 and hydrogen here, uh, and particular on one metal uh, in organometallic chemistry that has become very popular recently is manganese. Um, and, and I ask the sort of little bit, uh, um, yeah, uh, provocative question here, whether maybe manganese could play the role of a, of a better ruthenium in some of those reactions. Don't take me serious on that. Um, I'll, I'll give you some examples on this. So why are we interested in this? Why, why, why do we need something like power to X? Well, if you look around where you are now and you try to take away anything that has been made by a chemical process in the chemical value chain, then you will find very quickly that this would be a very hard life to live. Uh, in most parts of the world, it will be possible to live um, uh, because we don't have enough nutrition, uh, we don't have clothes to wear and so on and so forth. So the need, the hunger for carbon feedstocks is tremendous. And if you only look at crude oil, which is used both on the energy side as well as on the carbon side, Every day at the moment, we need 100 million barrels of crude oil every single day. And if you would really fill this in barrels and put them next to each other, that line would go one and a half times around the globe every single time, every single day of barrels of oil that, that, that we actually consume. So it's a mind staggering capacity and scale of an of, of a, of, of, of a industry that has developed. And we know that we need to to move into a new, more sustainable future, because both the energetic use, as well as the chemical use at the end of the day, will lead to this carbon that's in there being released into the atmosphere as CO2. And so that is certainly not a, a, a trajectory that we want to be on. But there is hope because we know already, we see it every day that there is an increasing amount of implementation of technologies that generate electricity and power without the use of carbon-based resources. We have wind, solar, we have geothermal energy sources. Um, um, so there are several types of technologies that generate electricity in particular without being dependent on the co-generation of CO2. So we can decarbonize this sector. And then there are the other two areas one is mobility, where we know that carbon-based liquid fuels are very well established. And for some applications like airplanes or heavy trucks, there is no good solution in the, in the foreseeable future. And of course, there are all the chemicals that we make, which, well, we all know that <laughs> they need carbon after all. So these two sectors, we cannot decarbonize so easily. But if we use that decarbonized energy, electricity, together with renewable carbon sources, CO2 or biomass, or carbon that we, we recycle once we've generated a product, then we can defossilize these other sectors. And that's what power to X means. We take the decarbonization of the electricity sector and we use it for the defossilization of the other sectors, ultimately reaching a situation where we get as close as possible to a closed anthropogenic carbon cycle. So why is it called fire and ice? Well, we all know that hydrogen, of course, is the high energy partner here in these reactions. It stores the energy that was originally generated. Uh, so we generate electricity and then we electrolyze water to generate hydrogen as the high energy reaction partner. And then we have the ice part, carbon dioxide, which we all know is dry ice and is very unreactive. In fact, it's used in fire extinguishers. So unlike hydrogen, it actually extinguishes fires rather than generating fires. So we combine these two, it's a very odd couple, a very highly energetic reactive molecule and a very low reactive molecule CO2. And we try to bring them together. And the way to do that, of course, is catalysis. We need catalysts to bring such very strange 
couples together to do what we want them to do. So here's the line from CO2 to methane. And in my talk, the carbon and the CO2, uh, the carbon dioxide will always be green and the hydrogen will always be red in order to sort of symbolize that high energy of the hydrogen and the greenness of the recycled carbon dioxide. And on the first level, if we add one hydrogen there, we reach formic acid. If we add another hydrogen and remove water, we come to formaldehyde and so on to methanol and ultimately to hydrocarbons to methane. So this is the C1 chain. And if we use renewable power, we can generate the hydrogen and we can go up and down that chain if we want. So these C1 molecules are very important because they store the energy that we include. But on each of these levels, on each of these levels of um, uh, oxidation state of the carbon, of course, there are what we as chemists call functional groups like carbonates, carboxylic acids, alcohols, methyl groups. And so rather than just making the C1 compounds, once we understand how we get from one level to the other, we can actually make much more complicated molecules using CO2 and hydrogen as the building blocks that you see here that are introduced in these molecules. And that's, that, that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to bring about catalysts that can do that scheme up and down here, the C1 chain, but also make them into more complex molecules. And so first of all, we need to understand how we move through this oxidation levels. And um, there are very few catalysts that actually can reach all the levels at the same time just by changing slightly the condition so that, that they are adaptive to make that. There are hundreds, if not thousands of homogeneous organometallic catalysts that can make formic acid derivatives from CO2 and hydrogen. There are very, very few, less than, a, less than 10 certainly, that can make methanol, homogeneous catalysts that can make methanol. And there are probably less than five that can react, that can stop the reaction at the formaldehyde level. And so this cobalt catalyst that uh, my colleague Christoph Verley here at the Max Planck Institute recently uh, designed, that cobalt catalyst is pretty unique because it, because it can reach all three levels with very high selectivity, as you see here. It doesn't do that for hydrogenation. It does it for hydrosilylation. But that is already helping us because we have a hydride and the silyl as a proton. So we, we learn something, how we go through the mechanism. And Hannah Karama, the PhD student that's working on this project, she studied in very great detail the mechanism, how this cobalt catalyst goes through the different levels. And it's like three catalytic cycles that are all carried by the same active species, which is this cobalt hydride here. Um, and, and with a combination of experimental and theoretical techniques in collaboration with Frank Nese, she's been able to map out the energy surface completely. This is only the sort of overarching picture here, each of these cycles, all the details on the, all the individual steps and intermediates and transition states have been studied there. Uh, and there are two very important points out of this energy diagram. The first one is there is a very stable low-lying intermediate here, and that's the formate complex. That's the complex that results from CO2 insertion into the metal hydride bond. And that's a very low barrier, but a very stable product. So the CO2 activation is not the problem. The CO2 insertion of the metal hydride is very straightforward, but the resulting complex, the first intermediate is very stable. It's the turnover determining intermediate. And then the following transition states to add hydrides to that formate to reduce it further, they're very high lying. And the one here in this particular case, the only reason why we can trap actually the formaldehyde level here is because it's not free formaldehyde, because it's formaldehyde in the derivative in these uh, diolato derivatives of the, of, the, of the silyl. Otherwise, the hydrogenation of the formaldehyde for the methanol has a very low barrier. It's almost impossible. I don't know any case where you can stop it at free formaldehyde, but you can stop it at formaldehyde derivatives if you're, if you're lucky at this stage. So this is a very channel phenomenon. This is true for at least all the hydrogenation catalysts for CO2 that I know that this first step is relatively straightforward, but then it's the hydrogen activation that is the limiting factor, not so much the CO2 activation, which is very often 
called a problem here. But if you want to go beyond the formate stage, it's really the hydrogen activation that is the tough part. Um, and that happens in a heterolytic cleavage. You need a proton and a hydride. And we know that for many, many years from a collaboration with Alain de Dieu back 25 years, he already pointed that out to us in this, in this collaboration on rhodium. And the same is true in ruthenium. And that's one of the very rare catalysts that ruthenium triphos that can hydrogenate CO2 beyond the formate level. And also from the mechanistic studies there, there is a hydride delivery to the polar bond. And then there is a heterolytic cleavage and a protonolysis of the metal oxygen bond that is formed and that's this very stable intermediate. So that's what we knew. And then we've been intrigued about five years ago when David Milstein and Matthias Beller um, and some other work, but they were really the ones that sort of got into our mind, showed that, well, you can do a, such a hydrolytic cleavage with manganese complexes very effectively across the manganese nitrogen bond of such a pincer ligand that has this non-innocent, as, as David Milstein calls it, NH group down here. So what this manganese complex does, as it's shown here, it activates hydrogen to form the manganese hydride and the proton goes to the nitrogen. So it does exactly what we want. So this was intriguing. We thought, okay, if that's the case, maybe manganese can help us in this, in this chemistry. And the very simple concept that we, we put forward then in, in, in the first papers on this was that we said, well, if we want to replace ruthenium with manganese in this chemistry, if we start, if we have chemistry that works with ruthenium two plus, then it makes a lot of sense to look for manganese one plus as the replacement. Because there is something in the periodic table that we know as the diagonal relationship. You may have learned this in your undergraduate studies for main group chemistry. Uh, um, magnesium is more similar to lithium than magnesium would be to calcium, for example. And, and, and so there is always this kind of diagonal relationship. And the simple reason is that ruthenium-2 and manganese-1 have the same electronic configuration. They have similar ionic radius or at least similar charge over ionic radius ratios. And, and so you, they, they kind of are comparable. Of course, this is highly oversimplified explanation. We could do this much more with looking into the orbitals and everything like that, but, but it works surprisingly well. Okay, and then of course, manganese is a hell of a lot cheaper and much more available than ruthenium. So that should be a good, a, a good way forward. Now, does it work? It took us quite a long time, five years to find finally a system where manganese could hydrogenate CO2 and hydrogen all the way to methanol. And you see that the conditions are rather drastic, but the key really to make it happen is the addition of, an, of, of a Lewis acid here. And why is that? Well, you probably could already figure why this is the case because the manganese formate complex, which was known before, is so stable that it doesn't turn over at that stage. So CO2 and hydrogen and the manganese are very good to make formic acid. That has been reported by Luca Gonzalvi. And this is the intermediate that's probably formed here. And manganese is also very good in hydrogenating esters to the alcohols. It does that. But once there is CO2 in the reaction mixture, then it never does that step again because it falls into that sink. And what the Lewis acid does, it, it takes away the formate and it replaces it with something less coordinating to the manganese. In this case, it's the isopropyl oxide here. And then uh, and actually we see this by NMR, isopropanol is eliminated and we form the uh, active species. So we basically reactivate that system and we unleash the formate resting state to go over. But it's not very effective, effective catalysis, but at least it's a first step. Now, if you want to avoid the formate intermediate, well, you just take out the CO2 and you replace it with CO. And then we do the same reaction and now it works very well. But again, there is a trick here. Why do we need still a trick? Because now the problem is a different one. It's not the formate intermediate anymore. It's the fact that a CO does not insert into a metal hydride bond. There is no example for a metal hydride carbonyl complex where the carbonyl would insert into the metal hydride bond. So we have to, again, play a different trick. And uh, Prakash and, and Bella, they activated the CO, the carbon monoxide, by converting it into formamide intermediates, base assisted. And either in one step or two steps, they showed that this is indeed possible. We did that with alcohols. So we use alcohol and base to make formate esters. 
And then this reaction works extremely well. The big advantage of that is that we can use methanol as the alcohol. So now we have only methanol, CO and hydrogen in the system and the catalyst. And that's what a chemical engineer calls a liquid phase methanol process. And they have been actually scaled up very significantly with heterogeneous catalysts in the 90s and studied. One of the major issues was um, uh, mass transfer limitations from the gases onto the solid catalyst. Now with a homogeneous catalyst, we would eliminate that mass transfer. But of course, at the present turnover numbers and turnover frequencies, we're not yet able to scale this up to 300 tons per day. Uh, but it shows you again that there are steps forward. Okay, we know the mechanism. I don't talk about it. All I want to say is that we know from the mechanism, this is fully reversible. And very recently, that's the latest in this development and it's coming up in, in Angewandte, it's online already. We can also decompose methanol to syngas, the other direction, just going backwards. And in this case, ruthenium works better than manganese. In the previous case, manganese was better than the ruthenium, but it's the same principle. So it's basically just a microscopic reverse of that mechanism. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but in principle, that's what it is. So what does that mean? That means that either from syngas or from methanol, we can go to form aldehyde because that must be the intermediate in this reaction. And if there is another alcohol there, the form aldehyde is quickly kind of protected in the form of the hemiacetal because otherwise the formaldehyde would polymerize and do stupid things. So there's a certain lifetime of formaldehyde in these mixtures, either coming from methanol or coming from syngas. And if we do that, then we may be able to use that formaldehyde as a building block. And that's exactly what works. So we can do methylations of alcohols by using methanol or syngas as a surrogate for the intermediate formation of formaldehyde by what is called a borrowing hydrogen mechanism. So we dehydrogenate the alcohols, the carbonyls do a base catalyzed condensation reaction, hydrogen is re-added, and there is the methyl group that is now introduced from methanol as a C1 building block, very selectively, precisely in the beta position of these alcohols. And you can make all sorts of compounds doing that. It's very selective, it's very tolerant of functional groups, and uh, you see a range of substrates that can be synthesized that way. Here's just one example of a possible application of this reaction. This is methylpropandiol, a very valuable chemical that from petrochemistry is pretty difficult to make. We can now do this from propandiol and methanol with over 70% yield under standard conditions with the green manganese catalysts. So certainly a much greener way to that chemical as originally as the, as the current one. Can we do it from syngas? Yes, we can. We can take carbon monoxide in a similar way, use the alcohol to activate it, and then again have formaldehyde plus the other active, uh, the other species here. All the rest remains the same. And sure enough, it works extremely well. We can use syngas in a totally new reaction of syngas to methylate alcohols uh, here in the beta position. Again, here is some of the scope. I won't go into any details, just some interesting features. CC double bond is not hydrogenated, so it hives that reaction even at 15 bar of hydrogen and 150 degrees centigrade. Uh, some functional groups are tolerated. Aromatic fluoride is not detached, um, so it's a very versatile reaction. Now with this, I'm, I'm at the end. I hope I've been able to show you that if we look at CO2 and hydrogen, we not just have to look at the sort of bulk, huge chemicals or fuels that we can make. We can also introduce functional groups in many ways, if we understand the mechanisms that are behind that, and ultimately we come to products that our society needs in a much greener way. Let me end with one personal note. 25 years ago, I've been fortunate enough to write my first review article in Angewandte Chemie uh, on the reaction of CO2 and hydrogen to give formic acid, or on the way to make formic acid from CO2. That's 25 years ago. Um, it was an article that had about 15 pages, and it was covering the hydrogenation and the electrocatalytic reduction of CO2 to formic acid. Now, recently, five years ago, we wrote together with Jürgen Klankemeyer a review article on CO2 and hydrogen with that story out here that had almost, what is it, 40, 45, almost 50 pages only on hydrogenation. And very recently, 
we published an article where we analyzed the electrochemical pathways for CO2 reduction, again in Angewandte Chemie. And that's almost a book that has 60 pages in Angewandte Chemie. I'm grateful to Wiley to allow me to publish a review article with 60 pages length, together with Christoph Welle, my, my colleague over here. So it just shows you how this field has exploded in this, in this period of time and how important that area of CO2 utilization is. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I ran a little bit over time, Natalie. Um, um, and, and just let me end with these two quotes. Insight must precede application. That's Max Planck and uh, another hero of mine, Nelson Mandela. It always seems impossible until it's actually done. Thank you very much indeed. Many, many thanks, Walter, for this really insightful talk. And it's, it's really interesting how we should start thinking or not start, but ideally be thinking about it already, about using the uh, carbon dioxide and, and the hydrogen to use them for chemical synthesis. So now we have few, we actually have five minutes left for questions. So perfect timing. Um, there is, I will start with the first one. So there's one from Gamini Rajapaksa. It is a general belief that second and third row uh, transition metal based catalysts are more active than the corresponding first row transition metal based catalysts. It is very interesting to see that manganese based catalysts are better than the ruthenium based ones. What makes manganese better than ruthenium in these cases? Yeah, it, it's uh, not generally the case, uh, but they start to be competing with ruthenium catalysts. That, and, and I think a lot has to do with this very simple diagonal relationship picture. Actually, just a couple of days ago, um, uh, Mashima from Osaka University has published in Organometallics now uh, a review where he analyzed more of these diagonal relationships. I was two years ago, I was touring Japan and I was giving a lecture. and so. Um, I think he was hopefully was inspired by that. And it is more general than manganese and ruthenium, funny enough. So no, it's not general. It's not always that manganese is better than ruthenium. But in certain cases, it, it actually is. And you can try to trace it back, like in the decarbonylation, the ruthenium has a stronger affinity for this. Uh, uh, sorry, in the decarbonylation, the, the, the um, ruthenium exchanges the, the CO very fast. In other reactions, it is blocked by the CO more strongly. And I'm sure that if you play with the ligand structure more than we've done up to now, you can, for certain reactions, either balance it, either have the ruthenium or the manganese better. But it's a case where really the 3D metal starts to rival the noble metal activity um, very significantly. And don't forget, ruthenium organometallic catalysis is 60 years old. Manganese organometallic catalysis is, is six years old. So we have some time to catch up. Perfect, thank you. So there's two more questions that have come in. Um, the first one is whether you could comment on the use of toluene in green synthesis and whether they're potential substitutes for this organic solvent. Well, toluene is a relatively green solvent. There, is a, uh, uh, there has been a lot of effort in the pharmaceutical industry to categorize the uh, solvents according to their greenness. It depends also on the framework, which companies, or they didn't all agree on, on each individual solvent. But there is a very nice review article in Green Chemistry where they, the Green Chemistry uh, Institute uh, had a round table of the pharmaceutical industry and they kind of harmonized all the kind of solvent uh, um, uh, lists that they had. And from the aromatic solvents and the organic solvents, uh, the hydrocarbon solvents, toluene was one of those that came out best. I mean, it's fossil based, but otherwise its toxicity is limited. Uh, it, it is not so volatile, so it doesn't really you're not so easily exposed to it. So it's certainly a replacement that you should use for benzene whenever possible. And, and as I said, toluene is, is from those aromatic solvents, toluene and silenes are probably those that are, that are coming out best. Um, and for, for non-polar solvents, we have very good alternatives, including supercritical CO2, a solvent that I love a lot, and that can replace toluene in, in many applications. Um, so, yeah, I, I would think there are opportunities and options there. Um, but if you have to use an aromatic solvent, toluene is not the worst of all choices. Thank you very much. Um, there's one final question, so I'll ask this one and then we'll maybe move on. Um, and this is, um, can we use copper hydride clusters supported with phosphine ligands for CO2 reduction? You probably can. Uh, I haven't tried, but I would think it is a good, it's not a bad uh, choice because copper is the element that is in the industrially used um, uh, methanol synthesis catalyst. This is 
copper um, uh, chromite on, on aluminum oxide. So that is certainly not a bad choice. And I would think that you have a good chance that it might, that might, uh, might actually work. But we haven't done any homogeneous copper catalysis for CO2 reduction ourselves, but yeah, it might well work. Excellent. And thank you very much again for your, your presentation. And we'll also see you in, in just a half an hour for our media editor session. Um, so we'll move on to our final speaker of today, May Nyman. Uh, she received a broad education with a BSc in geology, an MSc in material science and engineering, and a PhD in inorganic materials chemistry. She worked at Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico for over a decade in the environmental and energy sectors before joining the Department of Chemistry at Oregon State University as a professor in 2012. She also has a broad range of research interests, including metal oxide clusters, thin film materials, ion separations and catalysis, polyoxometallate chemistry and actinide chemistry. And she is also focused on promoting the advancement of underrepresented groups in STEM. She recently received a Humboldt Research Award from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, which has enabled her to come to Germany, where I believe she still is, uh, for conducting research with Carsten Streb at the University of Ulm and with Franziska Emmerling in Berlin. And today she will discuss how zirconium and hafnium chemistry can be differentiated through metal oxo clusters. May we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Ooh. Okay. Okay, so um, that's a relief. I thought my talk had disappeared. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, so Walter talked about some 60 year old chemistry and I got him beat. I'm gonna be talking about some 80 year old chemistry and uh, shedding the light on the process of separating zirconium from hafnium um, by solvent extraction. So this is a very old industry process and um, we have been recently um, uncovering the fascinating chemistry that, that allows us to do this. Um, this work was brought to us by actually a, a retired industrial chemist, Jim Summers, and I give him a lot of credit for the study that I'm presenting to you today. And uh, he's been mentoring um, a graduate student, Lauren Pallas, uh, on, on doing this research. So, um, before I'd like to uh, thank uh, Germany for a great six month visit where I have been. I'm closing in on the end of my um, Humboldt Research Fellowship. And I've been studying some rhenium chemistry and some cerium chemistry, which will be coming out in future publications, um, not quite ripe yet. And I would like to acknowledge, as, as Natalie mentioned, Karsten Streb at Ulm University. I was with him till the end of September. And uh, in Southern Germany, of course, this involves a few trips to the Alps. So here we are along with a uh, young six month old Max Streb in the Alps in June. And I'm currently at BAM in uh, Berlin and working with Anna Buzanich and uh, Francisca Emmerling um, on X-ray scattering, X-ray absorption techniques. And uh, it's, it's all been really wonderful, uh, Wonderful people, wonderful science, um, a, a very, very nice day in Germany. So thank you, Germany. And uh, also it's nice to be uh, hanging out with all of you today in the European time zone. Um, and that's why I'm presenting here and not with my American colleagues, I believe in, um, in December. Okay, so before I get started on the topic of today, just a, a broad, um, introduction to what we do in our lab. So we're mainly focused on metal oxo clusters from across the periodic table. So metal oxo clusters, you can think of as molecular metal oxides. And I'm going to go through some of the motivations of studying these that are listed on the right side as I show you examples from around the periodic table. Um, so these are all a structural motif called the Kagan ion, um, known for over 100 years in polyoxometallate chemistry, but emerging all over the periodic table. Um, so, for example, we study uh, the iron Kagan ion um, to, to understand its role in formation of iron oxide materials in nature, as this is a building block um, for one such structure called ferrihydrite. Um, the chromium Kagan ion um, was more of an intellectual curiosity. It was proposed to 
proposed to exist and supposed to exist um, for over 30 years. We were the first to crystallize it. Um, we have one more paper coming out on that. Um, moving over to the main group, we've also been studying uh, tin, um, alkyl tin Kagan ions. These are uh, used in nanolithography. So um, the small size, the high absorption cross section for extreme UV. Um, uh, they're very good for nano patterning in microelectronics. Um, zirconium and hafnium, it is the topic of, of, of my talk today, but um, we've been working on some other clusters. This is uh, functionalized with peroxide ligands, also for nanolithography, exploiting the radiation sensitivity um, of the peroxide ligand. And uh, niobium polyoxometallates has always been a mainstay in my research since 2002, when I had my first publication. This was published in 2021. Um, we're always looking at clusters as building blocks for materials, and I will return to that topic at the end of my talk. Um, going down to the bottom of the periodic table, the uranyl peroxide capsules. Um, if you're not aware of these clusters, they are uh, fullerene type topologies and, and really a fascinating family of compounds in particular because um, in the presence of radiation peroxide forms in nature and um, uranium likes to bond to it so much that there's actually a a urinal peroxide mineral in nature. Um, so that's a fun fact. And then finally, some, some recent work, um, some of it published in Angavanta, is on the hard tetravalent metal cations in the F block, um, uranium and cerium in particular. And uh, we've synthesized these, these beautiful rings um, with, with 70 metal centers, as well as this U84, uh, what we call a superatom. Okay, so um, my topic today is about zirconium and hafnium, and, and I'm doing something a little bit different. I'm just focusing on, on one small study. This is not even published yet. Um, the paper is about 90% complete, and we will be submitting it somewhere before the end of the calendar year. But zirconium and hafnium are famous or infamous for being the two most similar metals on the periodic table because of the lanthanide contraction. Um, they occur together in nature, and uh, most people do zirconium chemistry and, and assume that hafnium will follow suit. And that's what part of this talk is about today is, is it doesn't always exactly follow suit. Um, but zirconium and um, hafnium in parentheses are, are very useful metals uh, for acid catalysis, for example, for microelectronics, um, nanolithography, I've mentioned that a few times already. And uh, probably the most popular use is uh, framework materials, metal organic frameworks, and then this leads to all the applications like gas storage and uh, catalysis and so on. Um, but the nuclear industry is, is where I'm focusing my talk today. Um, but first, I'm going to talk about uh, a formation of um, the zirconium hexamer moth known as UIO66, because this kind of illustrates coordination chemistry, hydrolysis, and condensation chemistry. With zirconium and hafnium, and you know, also gives you a look at some clusters. So, um, if you were to buy something called zirconium oxychloride or hafnium oxychloride, what it actually is is this tetrameric cluster, and um, uh, it's it's four metal centers in a square, bridged by dihydroxides, and then capped with water. Basically, if you dissolve zirconium and hafnium in HCl, this is what you get. Now, um, if we add a bridging ligand, bidentate, carboxylate, or sulfate, and so on, um, you get the hexamer node of UIO66, um, which in its core, it's, it's uh, M6O parentheses comma OH8. Um, and there it is with acetate ligands. And if it's a ditopic linker, like benzene dicarboxylate, you get the very famous UIO66 moth. Okay, so this, this um, motif is known for many different linkers for all the hard tetravalent metal cations. It's been functionalized, it's been used for a million things. Okay, so uh, now for some less believed or uh, beloved or popular zirconium hafnium chemistry, but by far the most important in industry. So um, since 1940, the dawn of the nuclear age, um, scientists have been developing a way to separate zirconium from hafnium because uh, both are very important in the nuclear industry. So, and for, for even though their chemistry is almost identical, um, their nuclear chemistry is, is very different. So zirconium is essentially neutron transparent. And so, and it's, it, it makes um, good inert high temperature alloys. So it's used to clad um, fuel pellets. 
in in for uh, or re, uh, nuclear power reactors or um, producing nuclear fuel. And hafnium, on the other hand, uh, has a high cross section of capture of neutrons. Um, so, uh, for example, it's used as um, insertion rods to control. Um, nuclear reactions. So basically, we want to control where our neutrons are. And so um, the zirconium will tolerate no hafnium for its applications, and the hafnium will tolerate no zirconium for its applications. So we must have very effective separation of these two very similar elements. So this 80-year-old process um, has been developed as follows. So you mine zirconium, which contains a few percent hafnium always. You dissolve it in HCl. You get your uh, square cluster, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you add ammonium thiocyanate in a certain ratio that was empirically developed um, ratio to the metal. And, um, and then from there, it's a solvent extraction into methyl isobutyl ketone, which is immiscible with water. And the hafnium selectively extracts into MIBK. The zirconium remains behind. And then you get it back out as the oxides by back extracting from water. But we're focusing on this front part here. So um, it's not a terribly effective process. Um, it, it's only about 60% effective, but that's not really the focus of this study here. Um, neither is how can we improve it, although we found out how to make it worse, <laughs> um, or actually found out why this, this uh, three to one thiocyanate to metal ratio works so well. Um, and, but finally, what we're interested in is how does the aqueous and organic speciation of zirconium and hafnium differ leading to separation, and then uh, the bigger fundamental question of what, what does this help us understand about um, what's the same and what's the difference um, between zirconium and hafnium beyond its solid state chemistry. Okay, so um, how we did our experiments, very simple. Uh, we prepared our aqueous solutions separately, hafnium zirconium aqueous solutions separately. Um, and then we did the solvent extraction. We studied them in the aqueous phase. We studied them in the organic phase. We crystallized compounds out, et cetera. So uh, one of the workhorses of my lab is my little X-ray scattering. We have a, a lab instrument and I'm gonna show you a lot of spectra. So I'm gonna go through this one in a little bit of detail. Um, so it just doesn't look like straight lines to you. Um, so this is a log log plot. Uh, Q is our scattering vector. Um, intensity as a function of Q is our intensity. And um, I'm gonna point out a couple of things here as an example of how to read a Sachs plot. Um, so this is for hafnium, the blue line. This is for zirconium, the green line. And the first thing you notice is that the intensity of the hafnium, this is, uh, this is extracted into MIBK. Um, the hafnium uh, line is, is, has much higher intensity than the zirconium line. Okay, so this we know about the process. Hafnium extracts more effectively. Um, so the higher concentration as well as the larger species um, contributes to this higher intensity. Um, and then the second part of the curve, it, uh, this elbow here, this is called the Guinea region. Um, if it's out to higher Q, that means you have smaller species. If it's to lower Q, you have larger species. And if we've got a flat plateau region, this is usually an indication of a monodispersed system. So nothing's aggregating and everything's about the same size. Okay, so in summary, this curve for hafnium, it, it looks you know, promising for uh, a cluster about 10 angstroms in diameter. And you know, we actually did some fitting of this, which I'll show you in a bit. Okay, so the next step, let's see what we can crystallize out of the aqueous phase to see if we can understand what we're extracting into the organic phase. And from the hafnium solution, um, lo and behold, we crystallized this oxocenter tetrahedral cluster of hafnium, um, where each hafnium is capped with three thiocyanate ligands. And it has an overall four minus charge. So in order for it to do the solvent extraction um, into the organic phase, it must take four ammonium counter ions with it. This is just the rule of nature. You have to have charge balance. Um, the first thing we crystallize out of the zirconium solution is quite similar, but not identical in that it has got this extra bridging ligand. Okay, so it's got one extra negative charge, which means it has to take one extra cation along with it. And so initially we thought, okay, maybe that's the answer. Um, it, it just, this extra load of an extra cation, it's more difficult to extract. Um, but in the meantime, now we've got a structure so we can simulate scattering data 
and we compare it to the hafnium species extracted into the MIBK. And indeed, there's a very good match. Um, so we can confidently say we are extracting this oxo-centered tetrahedron into the MIBK and uh, in the hafnium form. Um, we can also compare the simulated scattering data for the zirconium cluster. It's not quite a good match. Um, if you were paying attention, you remember the shift in this uh, very weak Guinea region to the right means that smaller species are being extracted, um, but really not much is being extracted at all because our solvent scattering is higher than the, um, the cluster scattering. Okay, so coming back to this question, is this extra ligand really the key? Well, um, we were also able to crystallize out uh, the, uh, the isostructural form of the zirconium oxocentered uh, cluster. Um, and in fact, probably four out of five crystals that we measured um, had this overall topology in charge without the extra ligand. Um, so the answer is probably not, uh, but something else interesting is even in uh, this, this oxo-centered cluster here, without the extra ligand, we observe some disorder, okay? So the turquoise, and that's in the hydroxide bridges. So the turquoise um, are hydroxides that are quarter occupied and the red one in the middle is half occupied. And you can imagine um, if you have the settings with these turquoise hydroxides, you've got a lot of distortion in this cluster. Um, the cluster with the extra bridging thiocyanate also had distortion. Uh, so this is giving us some idea that zirconium chemistry is more flexible than hafnium chemistry, and we'll come back to that. Okay, so what is the role of the ammonium? So what we did next is we prepared our aqueous solutions with tetramethyl ammonium instead of ammonium, and we're looking at a couple questions here. We want to crystallize our cluster out of the aqueous phase. Is it the same topology? So does the ammonium play a role in formation of this oxo-centered cluster? Uh, we attempted the MIB extraction, so is the ammonium important for the solvent extraction? Okay, crystallization, the answer is yes for both hafnium and zirconium, and in fact for zirconium, we did not observe any of these clusters with the extra bridging ligands. We only observed the well-behaved oxo-centered cluster with a four minus charge with tetramethyl ammonium. Okay, so this suggests that the thiocyanate ligand uh, plays a role in capturing this unique uh, cluster topology of zirconium and hafnium not the ammonium. Um, regarding the solvent extraction, so here's the scattering curves you saw before, hafnium beats zirconium, hafnium is the oxo-centered uh, cluster. Here is with tetramethyl ammonium. So this is a very pathetic uh, scattering curves, both of them essentially nothing is being transferred into the organic phase. All we observe is uh, the solvent scattering in the high Q region. Um, so this tells us that the ammonium is important for uh, extraction to the organic phase. And, and remember, this is a completely empirically de derived um, process 80 years ago um, without all this atomic level information. We're just understanding it <clears throat> now with our advanced techniques. All right, so I'm saving the best for last, and that is characterization of the aqueous phase with the ammonium cations. Okay, so shown here, is uh, scattering curves for hafnium in blue and um, zirconium in green. And again, this is the aqueous phase prepared with the three to one ammonium thiocyanate to metal ratio that is the empirically de derived um, optimal recipe for this solvent extraction process. Okay, so you can see that uh, the scattering curves are quite different in this case. So our hafnium, um, lower intensity, and uh, zirconium, higher intensity with the, the Gunier region shifted to the left, as well as a slope up here. So either some polydispersity or some aggregation going on. So um, in the zirconium, ammonium thiocyanate solution, we have got larger species. And this could indeed um, be the answer to the question, why does hafnium extract so effectively um, where as zirconium does not? So uh, we're also comparing the, um, the simulated scattering data for the oxo-center tetrahedron to hafnium. And because the Guinea region is shifted a little bit to the left, that tells us that our our soluble species in water um, are a little bit bigger than the cluster that 
we crystallize. So we can do something called a size distribution analysis. It's a fairly simple and um, a visual way to look at the size of species in solution. Um, so uh, the blue is hafnium. And uh, the hafnium solution is dominated by something that has a diameter of about 10 angstroms. So that's about right for this uh, thiocyanate ligand oxycenter tetrahedron, um, plus about 10% population of something larger. And this could, for example, be uh, adducts with additional thiocyanate ligands um, stuck onto it. Um, so zirconium, we also see something a little bit larger, so maybe 12 angstroms in diameter, but also a larger size distribution. So remember, we did crystallize that one adduct with an extra ligand. Um, we do observe through disorder um, higher lability of our zirconium oxo cluster. So we are presuming that these are additional adducts, this major population, but we also have this much larger uh, cluster that is greater than 20 angstroms in diameter. Um, so in order to crystallize this out, the strategy that we use, so we've got our thiocyanate um, ligands that are, are end bonded. We've got those soft sulfur atoms sticking out there. Um, so we chose uh, to look at um, soft metal cations to crystallize out whatever that large cluster is. And um, it worked very nicely with cesium. So we crystallized this unique zirconium-48 topology. Um, and so just an aside here, we're, we're also interested in um, developing new cluster chemistry as building blocks for materials, um, both this oxocenter tetrahedron as well as the zirconium-48, I think um, will do nicely here. They're highly symmetric. Um, but anyway, uh, I'll, I'll tell you more details about this cluster in a moment since it is a new cluster topology and quite unique. Um, but our cesium are shown in purple spheres here and there are eight bonded to each cluster and they are indeed all bonded to the sulfur of the thiocyanate sticking out. Um, and uh, each one of these cesiums bridge to other clusters and they make up this uh, tetrahedral framework because this cluster is uh, kind of a pseudo tetrahedral shape. So let's take a closer look at the zirconium-48 cluster. Um, so it's got a zirconium-20 core, and this is our familiar um, zirconium 6 4 oh 4 or zirconium 6 comma oh 8 uh, cluster that is the node of UIO-66. And um, uh, the two blue ones are coming out of the page. The two green ones are going back. The, the four zirconiums in black are shared between um, the clusters. And then capping that is an additional, on each arm is an additional um, zirconium hexamer. And this one is a trigonal pyramid. So there is one triangle, there's the other triangle. And then um, if that isn't all weird enough, we just got this extra zirconium in pink um, that links the, the core uh, classical cubic ZR608 to this, um, this trigonal pyramidal um, cluster for a total of 48 zirconiums. Okay, so that is zirconium 48. So with the structure in hand, we can play the same game with the x-ray scattering. We can now simulate our data and we can compare it to the original aqueous solution from the industrial process with zirconium. Um, so the simulated scattering data is in blue, uh, the, the um, aqueous solution is in purple. Um, it's, it's not a perfect match, but we know this because we know this solution also contains the tetrahedral clusters that we're able to crystallize out, and we can see that in the scattering data. Um, but in the, the uh, most to the left Guinea region, we do have a pretty decent overmap, overlap. So I think we can confidently say that um, this cluster is present in solution and it is just too large to extract into the organic phase. Okay, so a couple more experiments. Um, so I did mention the empirically optimized ratio of thiocyanate to metal is three to one in the industrial process. Uh, we decided to double this concentration and uh, see what happened. And um, so we did this and we uh, characterized the solutions by SACS. We did the solvent extraction. So actually both zirconium and hafnium extract more effectively at this ratio, um, but uh, the extraction of zirconium is increased more than the extraction of hafnium. So you don't get as effective separation. But the reason that I wanted to show you this 
is uh, this is really textbook SACS. I, I love the SACS data and let me explain why. Um, so the, this, is, this is the aqueous solution with excess um, thiocyanate ligand. The red is the simulated zirconium. Um, the green is the, uh, sorry, purple is the experimental zirconium. The green is the experimental hafnium. The black is the simulated hafnium. Um, so there's a difference in the Guinea region. You would look at this and you would say, well, zirconium is bigger than hafnium, but we know from the crystal structure, they're the exact same size. So you would not get this information from light scattering, for example, but because it's an X-ray technique, we do get this difference. And what the difference is, is we get significant scattering from these sulfurs out here. Um, and since it's an X-ray technique, the, the higher uh, the electron count of your metal, the more scattering you get. So in essence, um, you've got more contrast between your hafnium and your sulfur than between your zirconium and your sulfur. So in essence, your, your scattering vectors that account for the electron density um, are smaller for hafnium than for zirconium. And that's why it appears smaller by X-ray scattering. So um, I will include this in my lecture uh, next time I lecture about X-ray scattering um, at OSU. Okay, so uh, back to the fundamental question. Um, how does the chemistry differ in our current study and uh, how does it differ um, in the bigger picture and why does it differ? So uh, let's go back to the variations on um, just the, the oxo-centered zirconium hexamer cluster. Okay, so as I mentioned, even if we don't have the extra ligand, we've got, uh, we've got disorder and we can get some pretty weird angles and as well as with the extra ligand. And uh, the, the distortion is between the bridging OHs, metal OH. So we can look at this bond angle for the collective uh, zirconium, oxocentered zirconium clusters. Um, we have a range between 80 and 133, um, whereas in the hafnium clusters, it's 104 to 113. So hafnium is, is much better behaved in this case. Um, it's more inert. Uh, zirconium is more flexible in both ligation and its hydrolysis chemistry. And I, I just want to, um, point to some recent publications of ours, back-to-back uh, -back in Jackson in organic chemistry, where we looked at ligation or disruption of this ordinary um, square cluster with peroxide. Uh, with zirconium, with disassembly, reassembly from the peroxide ligand, um, we also got an oxo-centered um, tetrahedral cluster, but with peroxide bridging in this case, and we also got this beautiful zirconium-25 pentagonal wheel. Um, hafnium barely reacted. We basically just had insertion one or two peroxides with hafnium. So, so very different chemistry um, where zirconium and hafnium is assumed to be the same. So this can be a take home message for um, students studying inorganic chemistry, say in the undergraduate or graduate level. Um, so why does it differ? And this comes back to the lanthanide contraction and insertion of the F orbitals. I would like to tentatively say that um, hafnium orbitals are more contracted due to the insertion of the entire uh, 4F row. Um, so they're not available as available for bonding um, as diffuse as the zirconium orbitals. So um, in these aqueous conditions and cluster forming conditions and so on, um, zirconium is just, just uh, more flexible and labile to both hydrolysis reactions as well as coordination chemistry with ligands. Um, okay, so that was in the wrong order. <laughs> so uh, we're not done yet. Um, we're gonna submit the paper somewhere. Um, and then following on this and already starting on this, we wanna actually look at mixed metal solutions. Um, so does the self-sorting into clusters take place at the atomic level? So does zirconium form its own clusters and hafnium form its own clusters? And we're gonna look at this both computationally and experimentally. And computationally, we wanna understand why. So um, if they are self-sorting or, or narcissistic as a colleague of mine called it, um, so, so why is this? Which ones are most stable? And as well as what's the role of the orbitals in differentiating zirconium and hafnium chemistry that, uh, that I just described in the last, I don't know how many minutes. Um, 
just I'm going to finish up with uh, an opportunity if you like metal oxo cluster chemistry. So right now the Department of Energy is is really interested in um, recycling electronic waste. So separation of lanthanides is important and uh, separation of noble metals is important. So these all form clusters. Um, maybe clusters can be used um, to, to uh, separate the metals on the atomic level, followed by either crystallization or solvent extraction. So that's something we're thinking about as well. So thank you very much um, for attending our session. I'm really uh, happy and proud to be a part of this elite group of chemists and also provide my services to Angavanta um, in this manner. Many, many thanks, May. We're really glad to have your support and advice as advisory editor of the journal. And thank you, of course, also for this really clear presentation. We're right on time to start the Meet the Editor session, but I see there's already one question in the Q&A, and that is whether it is possible to use cation exchange resins to separate zirconium 4 plus and hafnium 4 plus. Oh, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, so uh, zirconium, normally when you're doing um, or using cation exchange res resins, you are exchanging a simple cation. And um, even in the most acidic conditions, you cannot shut down this hydrolysis chemistry that zirconium and hafnium does. So um, as I said, you just simply dissolve zirconium in, in HCl because you need acid to dissolve it. It, it automatically forms uh, a cluster. Um, it's a polycation, um, meaning a cation, but but it's still a cluster. So um, so I don't think uh, these exchange resins are are optimally suited for zirconium and hafnium. Excellent, thank you. So I cannot see any further questions for me specifically. So I would like to ask uh, the other speakers of today to switch on their cameras again. And I would like to ask the audience, please ask any questions that you have about Angewandte, about the advisory editors and their role um, through the Q&A uh, function. So I cannot see any questions right now. So maybe I'll, I'll get this discussion started, but please do uh, share your questions. And maybe would one of you like um, to talk about why uh, you joined Angewandte as an advisory editor? What motivated you to take up this, this role with the journal? One may I start something we'd like to. <laughs> well, since I'm, I'm unmuted and you know in the talking mode, um, so uh, the honest answer because I was asked. <laughs> um, I I've been a metal oxo cluster chemist my entire career. I feel like Angavanta has always been very supportive of metal oxo cluster chemistry. Um, maybe partly because a lot of this chemistry uh, has been developed in Europe and it's a European journal. Um, and uh, it's, I mean, really it, it's one of the flagship journals for chemistry. And uh, I feel that I am a good conscientious reviewer and you know, with a, a, a broad background in all kinds of chemistry at this point. And um, I felt like I could, could make a good contribution in this role. Absolutely, thank you. And maybe regarding the role of an advisory editor, Walter, how has it been like for you over the past few months or where do you really see you can make an impact? What are you excited about um, in your work with the journal? Well, it's really the possibility to have a close contact to the editorial office in the way to shape the uh, gamut that the journal runs. What is the scope of the journal? Where does it go in the future? Um, I think we have a, a, a good opportunity with perspective articles, with the, the review articles to see these are emerging areas. This is what's coming up. Um, so in addition to the sort of educative role that sometimes if things are difficult to decide that you might call on us, I think this forward-looking role to say this is uh, where the field, not just Angevante Chemie, but the field of chemistry should go. And obviously with Angevante as the flagship journal in, the, in, in, in chemistry, it is a, a, um, a platform to shape the future. And, and that, that's what most excites me to, to have that opportunity 
in the collaboration with you folks at the at the editorial office with the colleagues at the advisory board and of course with the community to say that's where that's where things could uh, could develop and identify emerging areas soon and, and set the pace a little bit so that's that's great fun excellent thank you very much and I mean, Helma, you've just been elected as chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee a couple of months ago, I think. So what's exciting for you about your role with the journal and about shaping the future of Angemante, really? Um, so it's, you know, we've had the first meeting with the newly elected editors and, and there was a lot of excitement and, you know, going into the future and really thinking about what has been wonderful about Angevanter already and how it can be further improved in um, nowadays. That's really, that's, an, that's a really exciting task to have. And, you know, the diversity is something that we, goes from different continents, different countries, um, gender fields, all of those are important aspects and that there's been a lot of momentum and we want to keep this going. Definitely, thank you. So to the audience, please, please keep asking your questions, especially now about, about Angewandte and uh, anything you might want to ask the advisory editors, we're really keen to hear from you. Um, Maybe in, in the meantime, one, one more question for me. I mean, a lot of what we do is about making sure that the peer review process is, is good, it provides value. So what for, for you, from your experience as an, as an author and a reviewer, what, what is good peer review? Is that, is that something that's really, really matters to you? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, Every, everybody has had the, the experience of a negative peer review for sure. And um, I mean, it, it's quite simple to me. Um, when you review a paper, check your negativity at the gate, you know, leave it behind. And um, what you're looking to do is improve the paper, right? Help improve the paper. Um, use your expertise uh, where where you have the expertise and, and you know, also don't be afraid if you don't have all the expertise because you're never gonna have all the expertise to say, I have these expertise and I am reviewing it in, in this area. Um, and I think that's how you can be a most uh, supportive and um, a good reviewer. And, and really don't, you know, don't make it personal, make it about the science. I think constructive criticism. Huh? This is what the peer review should provide, um, and 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 asking relevant questions. Um, not necessarily. Did you, if you did something with triphenylphosphine, did you also check for cyclohexyl phosphine? Um, but 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 really have like a constructive criticism. Say I don't follow this hypothesis. Can you elaborate on that? And and uh, and it's very helpful. I mean, in many cases. I think most many of my papers have been improved after going through peer review. So I'm very happy. I, I don't think I can't think of any better mechanism. Uh, it's a little bit like democracy. It's the it's the best of all bad uh, ways to run a country, and and that's the best of all bad ways of <laughs> controlling science. I don't think any, there's anything better than that. Absolutely, I think it is fair to say that papers who have gotten good criticism have improved overall. And it's something where reviewers need to make sure that they're um, issuing the reviews in a respectful manner. Um, take the time, that's something that's a precious good these days to take the time to really do that. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's something that our community re relies on and makes us all better. Definitely, okay. and now we can yeah, something that I would like to add, just thinking about recent experience in reviewing something. Usually, if I go through and you know come to the end of reading the paper thinking, I didn't understand that. Um, first, I think, oh, it's because it's a badly written paper. <laughs> but then usually, if I go back and you know read it in depth and write the review as I'm reading it, most of the time, nine times out of the 10, I realize, no, I didn't read it carefully. And uh, this, this is another advice that 
um, I'd like to give to reviewers is, um, you know, really, really take the time to do a good job because it, it matters to the author and, uh, and it matters to the community. Thank you. Yeah. I can maybe add from the editorial perspective also in, in handling the submissions, we understand when somebody declines a review. I think that that's absolutely fine, right? Everyone is, is really busy and it's fine. If you're too busy, then, then this is of course always an, an option and then there'll be further opportunities to, to be engaged in the peer review process. We actually have two questions from the audience now. So thank you for those. So the first one is uh, by Eugen Merkur. And his rather general question, he says, is would it not be a good idea to have more of really applied chemistry, like the name of Angewandte Chemie suggests, to be even more pronounced in, in the journal? Walter, you're... Yeah, probably because maybe from the three of us, I'm, I'm the one that is closest to some applications because we have some process that actually made it into industry. Um, uh, already. Um, I, I don't think there is anything like that. There is science and application of science. There is very difficult to define what is applied science. Um, and and um, in the original papers, in the research papers, we should really look for the um, fundamental improvement of our science. But in, in review articles and in perspectives or something like that, then it's very interesting to see also what comes out of that in terms of application, where does it make an impact? Um, in, in, in industrial reality. Um, but the first thing uh, I, I, I take from an Angewandte paper is, did it, did it create some new knowledge that wasn't there before I read this paper? Uh, that could be, of course, hey, there is a new process out that you haven't realized, uh, but that may be not a traditional research article, but yeah. more like a, a perspective or, or a highlight article and in that respect. Thank you. Helma, you want to add something? Yeah, I, you know, I completely agree with what, 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 what Walter said. I also want to remind everyone that, you know, very often fundamental science that has not been issued or not started with a view to applications has turned into applications on the long run. So it's very hard to judge what is applied and what is at the onset, just a curiosity driven question. And I think the balance is absolutely important. It's again about diversity that is, you know, both has its place. And often one might look back and think, well, this was more applied than I thought. Yeah, thank you. There's another question from Ishak Khan. Um, as a premier chemistry journal, Angewandte Chemie editors have a major role in defining or steering the direction of chemistry to help me genuine needs of society or humanity, and also to try and stop from going in areas that could be detrimental to environment and society. And um, they would like to hear the, the views of the speakers um, on these thoughts. Not sure whether I should start again, because, uh, but uh... As I've been working before I joined Angewandte Chemie many years for the journal Green Chemistry at the RSC, um, I think it's very clear that chemistry has a pivotal role in, in developing a future sustainable society. But there is a lot of chemistry out there that is very fundamental to first of all understand the principles um, uh, of how bonds are formed, how bonds are broken and things like that. And so we need that as well. To have directions that are detrimental to science, I think they're very clear ethical guidelines, not just in Angewandte, but in many journals that, that things that are obviously like, you know, chemical warfare or something like that, mm -hmm. um, that, that these are issues that, that, that are dealt on an ethical level. Um, so um, I think uh, we, um, if we follow those guidelines, the, the science otherwise should be, should be free and open because very often we can't foresee the consequences that, that come out. But if we see consequences that are negative, then we have to highlight them and, and, point, them, and point them out very clearly. Thank you. Uh, May? Yeah, so I, I agree with Walter. If, um, I think if, if we focus only on the most important societal needs. I think that narrows the scope a little bit. And Angevante Chemie is uh, a, it's a general chemistry journal. And I think um, it would 
be somewhat detrimental to, to that goal of being a general chemistry journal um, if, if it were narrow, narrowed down to only um, what is uh, the urgent societal need. Uh, although granted, um, that can be defined very broadly. Oops. But, but adding to this, of course, the respect is foremost important here too. Not sure where the question was going. This would need further clarification. So I, I, narrowing the signs would be bad, but of course, respectful and ethical issues are absolutely important to be accommodated. Definitely. So we have time for a few more questions, so please keep them coming. Um, maybe one more question from my side. There's been quite a lot of talk about open data, open science recently. Has that influenced the way you're doing your research yourself? Has that been discussed a lot in, in your various research areas? I mean, you, you have quite different um, areas of chemistry that you cover? Is that something that's discussed a lot? So, you know, open, 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 open access has, of course, been a, a big um, issue. Um, in, Switzerland has, has been running a fairly liberal policy in this respect, but yes, funding institutions asked for open access and open data. Um, for industry, you know, there's there's an industry industrial component, there's an academic research component that are very important to consider in this regard. Um, I, you know, I think me and my colleagues have not. I mean, we've looked into this, and of course, everybody should have access to the, um, the data that we produce. And clearly, you know, society has a right to know what is done with taxpayers' money. And that's where most of our funding comes from. So we have launched, you know, I have been myself quite active, but there's more and more um, also um, dissemination and kind of meeting the general public in on radio columns on, on science, which I think is a great way of also describing it, because I think one should not forget that a scientific research article is not necessarily steered to laymen. Um, so it is important to translate it and make it understandable. And, and maybe that's not the platform of a scientific journal, but it's a platform on the general media. And that's incredibly important. Thank you. Maybe I have maybe one question for you. You've mentioned in the past to me that mentoring is, is very important to you and you really enjoy mentoring team members and, and students. Is there any advice you would have for someone who really wants to become a better mentor or do more mentoring? Is there something you would kind of share from your, your experience? Well, um, funny you ask, uh, one of my favorite mentees is actually on the meeting. <laughs> um, and uh, we, we had a frank conversation once about uh, my mentoring and, um, uh, she she mentioned that I was uh, quite critical. Um, so I guess based on that feedback that I got from her, um, at, at this point I've lost the question. Um, I, I think I think being incredibly supportive uh, yet critical, uh, meeting people where they're at, um, and recognizing where your your mentees are coming from a very different place and a very different level. Um, being a good role model, so uh, so modeling good behavior and um, just being very loyal to supporting your mentees. Um, you know, give them give them every opportunity that you can, push them to work hard and um, watch them fly. Thanks. Well, I mean, clearly, you know, mentoring is incredibly important. We all. Are you know in a way this is this is also interacting with peers, but also mentoring of our own students. You know the way that I try to do it with mine. You know, yes, you know, you, you don't get anywhere unless you're really enthusiastic about something. You know, so I'm not I'm not the one who pushes people 
too hard, but it's their own it's the own motivation that really drives you forward because you have fun. And obviously, then there are down moments. I think every graduate student has had that, um, where you need others to then pull you out of the dig when seemingly nothing works and nothing is moving forward. Um, and then it's important to have a team around you and someone you can relate to. That's your team members, but that's then also your mentor. And that's, that's a lot what our role is, to provide an environment where science is what it is, fun yeah. and meaningful. Absolutely. It's the most fun part of what we're doing. We write proposals, we write papers, we do lectures like here, but interacting with the young generation and see them grow is the most rewarding part of our profession. That's why I would go back to academia again if I would restart. Not, the other things are fine as well, but this is really what keeps, what keeps me going. There are products. You know, we're not industry. We don't have products. Our students are our products. <laughs> Even more than that. Well, thank you for all these questions that have come in. I don't know whether there's anything from, from the advisory editor side that you would, would wish to share with the audience, anything we've not covered that you think would be worth um, discussing? See no, uh, maybe comments at the moment. Um, let's see. Yes. Maybe one, uh, Walter, there was one question that came up in my head while I was listening to your talk, and that's you have a lot of experience in, in working with the chemical industry and with chemical engineers. Is there any advice you have for, for other chemists, perhaps, that wish to see their, their science develop more into applications and to you know, start collaborations? It's difficult to give an advice. It's, it's, it's something that really goes both ways. You have to find your right, the, the right partner that you're talking to. And, and I've been lucky in my, in my career that I found them on, on, and, and they were open to the discussions. And then you have to be clear and very reliable. If you promise something, you say, I'll, I'll, I'll be working on this and then really deliver and, and show that this is something you can um, you can do and don't do it for the for the money or for the collaboration to, to get another student or something do it because you're interested in that in that topic and, and then and then it might develop uh, that would be the, so reliability is very important to to and, and for both sides find a partner that you trust and do something that that they can relate to uh, that that's all i can say the rest has been luck to just be there at the right time at the right place Seem to have lost my connection. You're back. Yep, we hear you. And we we hear you fine, Natalie. Oh, now she's frozen. I think. Oh. But I guess we're. This just means we're coming to an end anyway. Right? Yes. <laughs> or devil, you, you need to take over now. <laughs> yeah. I think I think we we've come to an end. It was great, you know, for all the questions that we got from all the participants, and that you know, I'd like to thank you on behalf of all of us here at the journal and all the uh, scientific advisory committee for their great talks this afternoon, um, and for all the questions that came out of the uh, the audience. Lots of things for us all to think about, you know, going forward. And if you have anybody has any ideas about what you'd like to see in the journal or what you think we could improve then please feel free to contact either the editorial office or any of the uh, advisory editors that we have in our group. Uh, you know, these things get passed on and we can discuss then how we can make chemistry and, and anger banter better going forward. And that's what we're all looking to do. So, okay. Natalie, do you want a final word that you're now back? That's fine. Thank you, Neville, for taking over. No, it's been great to see everyone and uh, yeah. Okay. Then okay. Thank you. Take care, everybody, and look after yourselves and send Thank us your you. next great paper. Yeah? Thank Take you. care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. To Natalie and Neville, too. Great job. Bye. Thank you.